It's a girl's dream to marry a rock star. But not every rock star is marriage material. Oh, yeah, none of us liked him. Carol let him domineer. She doesn't normally do that. Todd Garton uses lies to invent new identities and manipulate others. It's just a pathological liar. From what I know of him, he'd be the greatest car salesman ever. When the pressures of family life Todd, get to be too much, we're gonna have a baby. Todd turns to an old lover. I think the two of them together are really bad news. It's a dark side of his personality. He creates a new story, a masterpiece of deception to rid himself of his obligations and his family. He finally brainwashed me. And that's when I just let go and said, Todd, I'll just kill anybody you want. What are you doing? My name is Steve Sharippa. I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. I've seen good people turn bad and bad people turn worse. Some took contracts to carry out a hit. Some were victims of a hit. To hit men, life and death is just part of the business. It's nothing personal. May 16, 1998, Cottonwood, California. Norman Daniels is a reluctant hitman heading out on a job. He has it on good authority that his target, Carol Garton, is a highly trained assassin. Her life as an ordinary office worker is just a cover. Trouble is, it's all a lie invented by Carol's husband, Todd. It's not my wife. It's the target. What you're going to do what you're getting paid to do. The story of Carol Garten's death is a weird one, so let's start with some things we know for sure. Carol Garten is not a trained assassin, but hitman Norman Daniels believes she is. Carol's husband, Todd, concocted an amazing story, one so fantastic he's able to convince his friend to kill Carol. You know, you don't meet them often in real life, but Todd Garten is an evil genius. <laughs> Todd and Carol's story starts in Portland, Oregon, 10 years earlier in the late 1980s. Young Todd Garten is living his dream. He's a rock star. He's the leader of a band, Detente Touch. Todd Garten really was exciting to be around, and he was just full of energy and no good. All that he talked about was, I want to be in a band, I want to be famous, and I know how to get there. It's the end of the Reagan years, and the Pacific Northwest is the breeding ground for a raw new sound that's just right for the times. Bored, yet angry. It's called grunge. Now, Garn isn't really a rebel. I mean, he sure doesn't reject mainstream success. He wants to be a megastar. Todd was definitely running things. Definitely running things. It was his band. Now, I was the lead singer, but I was his creation. I was Carol Batchelor when I met him. He created Ursula D. He named me. He gave me the persona. He taught me what he wanted me to do. I don't know how he knew this, but he had just formed a plan, and we went ahead and went with it. And we trusted him, and it worked. Todd had a vision for what it was that he wanted to say, and that was really the most important part. It didn't matter if it was good. It mattered that he believed what it is that he was selling. A lot of his songs had kind of political overtones to them, especially about the, uh, the cause in Ireland and the, the troubles there. Todd's passion and his larger than life personality helped make Dayton touch a big deal. In Portland, anyhow. Now me? Well, back then, I'm in Vegas working at the Riviera Hotel. And there's not a lot of calls for grunjacks on the strip, so detente touch 
never comes our way. But I can tell you about rock stars. Sure, they get worshipped on stage, but the real action's backstage. And Todd Garton lives for the attention. But when Todd meets Carol Holman, there's something special about her. She's different from the other girls. She's so sweet. Just the sweetest person I've ever known. She was so gentle, soft-spoken. You just wanted to hug her all the time. We were wreaking mayhem, but she was the one that kind of kept the lid on it and kept us from diving off balconies. She was the, you know, stabilizing force. So Todd and Carol hit it off. His friends think Carol's great. Her family isn't so happy. They think Todd's a bully. Oh, yeah, none of us liked him. You know, he was one of those dropouts from high school, was going to play in a band and all that kind of stuff. Pretty scrappy looking and, you know, no job. Carol acted completely different around Todd than she did around other people. I mean, she let him domineer. She doesn't normally do that. Despite her family's disapproval, no one is more put out by the Carol Todd romance than Todd's girlfriend. Oh, yeah, there is that little complication. The girlfriend's name is Lynn Arson, and her love for Todd knows no boundaries. Lynn was this groupie that hung out. She was, you know, part of Todd's clothing at that point. You couldn't shake her off. My opinion of her at the time was she was a complete vacuous little slut. So Todd's got two women in his life, and they couldn't be more different. Carol's your all-American, feet-on-the-ground sweetheart. While Lynn, well, she appeals to Todd's wilder side. The power he has over her is its own kind of erotic thrill. She fell in love to such a degree with Todd that she took a razor blade, scratched a heart on her thigh, and put a T in the middle of it for, for Todd. Anything Todd wanted her to do, she would do. Absolutely anything. She would never say no to Todd. Lynn was the negative alter ego, the dark side of his personality that he, that he played off of. Todd isn't just dark, he's dangerous. He's obsessed with the troubles in Ireland, which lead him to a weird fantasy life. Todd's persona was that he ended up in Northern Ireland teaching how to clean and fire hunting rifles. It's just in Northern Ireland. It's called a sniper rifle. I didn't care if there was any truth to it or not. And over a period of, you know, 10 years working with him, the story stayed consistent. And Lynn, well, she believes all of Todd's fantastic stories about being an assassin for the IRA. He even gives her pictures as proof. Lynn took it hook, line, and sinker the things that Todd was telling her about his days as a teenager in the IRA. Having an obsessed groupie is great, but Todd realizes that Carol's the keeper. She doesn't fall for Todd's absurd James Bond fantasies, but she does fall for him. It doesn't happen right away, and some hearts get bruised, but in the end, Lynn is pushed aside. Carol moves in with Todd. There was uh, several occasions where Lynn showed up and Carol put her foot down and said, this is not going to happen. And so she would disappear for periods of time, and then she'd show back up, and. Carol would have to get the broom and chase the rat out. Dayton touch doesn't last. Carol doesn't mind that his rock star days are done. 
Carol was the rock that actually gave him a foundation to build something good off of. I think Carol was the strong side, was the, the rational side. Todd takes the end of his glory days very hard. I mean, you don't just put your ego in a scrapbook. Todd Garton needs to reinvent himself. The problem for Carol is that Todd's transformation will make him much more dangerous. May 16, 1998. Cottonwood in Northern California is a small, close-knit town. But today, a hitman is driving its streets. Norman Daniels is on his way to his very first assignment. Carol Holman, now Garton, is eight months pregnant. She's clueless to the horror headed her way. A horror set in motion by her husband, Todd. California is a really good place to reinvent yourself. So after his rock star career craters, you'd think Todd would try again. I mean, showbiz success is all about determination. Todd's got determination in spades, but over the last 10 years, it hasn't helped him one bit. When his music career dies, he pulls a 180 and enlists in the Marines. Soon after, he and Carol get married. But Todd gets hurt in basic training, and his military career ends before it begins. He couldn't finish basic training, and I know that was a huge blow to him. Just completely devastated him. Next, Todd embarks on a series of schemes. He starts a concert promotion company. He opens a club. He even tries running a camp for troubled teens. All of them fail. One of the things Todd feared most was happening. He had kind of one low-paying job after another. For somebody with so much imagination as Todd, life in Cottonwood would have been very boring. So by the late 90s, Todd is scraping by as a fence builder. His life isn't what most people would consider hell. He and Carol aren't really prosperous, but she's the breadwinner. It's her steady income supporting them both. Carol even tolerates her husband's hobby of telling his pals he earned the medals she knows he bought. What do you think? He likes to talk, he likes to tell stories. He liked to build himself up to something, then act like he was big shot or smarter, knew something. <laughs> Todd's still telling people he was an IRA killer. And now he's adding a new lie about being a crack Marine sniper. I don't think you can tell a sociopath, you know. If maybe we'd been around them more, you know, and saw how they interacted with each other, we might have noticed something, but we weren't there. Todd's great at hiding his fantasy life from Carol, too. You heard the stories? Now you see the proof. He's a con man who knows you only float lies past people who will believe them. Luckily for him, he's found a couple of simple-minded marks. Norman Daniels and Dale Gordon. Unlike Todd, Dale Gordon really served in the Marines. Now he runs a machine shop in town. Todd showed me medals about him in the Marine Corps. I don't know where he got it all. I don't know. I mean, he had like like uh, Purple Hearts and all this stuff. He always talked about how he was a Marine sniper and, and this and that. And I was a little bit gullible back then. And I always thought to myself, Marine's not going to do this to another Marine. And he sure did. He sure messed me over real bad. There's a gun show almost every month up here. And you can go to these shows and pick up pretty much any army emblem, knife, gun, badge, whatever you want. 
and it's very simple to put together you know, that sort of a persona that everything you need is out there easy to get you just have to have the creative enough mind to put the whole thing together as for norm daniels well he's a single father he pumps gas trying to make ends meet for him and his son Todd's stories of action and adventure have Norm hooked. It is. Norman worked for a living. He tried to take care of his kids. He tried to do what was right. I think he just got conned and manipulated just like I did. Norm and Dale are straightforward, small town guys. Todd says he's a sniper, that he takes on secret missions to rub out America's enemies. I mean, nobody would make that stuff up. Why would they? In Todd's hands, these two chumps are lambs to the slaughter. What he told me was that he went down to Nicaragua and uh, was assassinating people for a living, that he killed a lot of people in the Irish Republican Army. Norman was a little bit naive, but also Todd was very convincing. He knew about sniper rifles. He knew about silencers and scopes and all those things. To me, he's just a pathological liar. I think he almost believes the, these stories. While Todd's keeping busy constructing a new fantasy life for himself, Carol, well, Carol is still living in the real world. Basically, Carol was the breadwinner in the family. She always had a steady job, was well-liked by her employees and her managers. Early one September morning in 1997, after six years of marriage, Carol's got the news she's been waiting for. Todd. She hopes it'll bring them together. Honey. Make them a family. We're gonna have a baby. <laughs> Can Todd rise to the occasion and become a caring husband and father? Who are we kidding? He fails miserably. Remember his old squeeze, Lynn Austin? Todd sure does. Truth is, Todd and Lynn have kept tabs on each other over the years. She remembers and misses the passions they shared. The best part for Todd, Lynn still believes all those stories. Like his new pals Norman Dale, she believes he's a rock star, sniper, hitman. Todd knew he had a fan in Lynn. And they were sending each other letters. She had a lot of his clippings that she put in her notebook. It's the same love triangle from Todd's rock star days. But now Lynn represents something new. She's freedom and desire. An escape from having to grow up and be a father. I think the two of them together are really bad news. It's a dark side of his personality, and I think that they will always have this connection. Lynn's still living near Portland. When it looked like Todd was gone for good, she married a guy named Dean Noyce. They now have two kids and a rocky relationship. Our relationship had degraded. There were a lot of other pressures. We were kind of you know, becoming more and more estranged all the time. That was part of the thing that was tearing us apart all the, through the, the winter and spring. Todd tells Lynn everything she wants to hear. He's still working with the IRA, but now does contracts for the US government. And best of all, we should be together. We just have to get rid of these roadblocks to our love. Blah, blah, blah. I think he was selling that to her, that I'm not happy with Carol, I'm gonna leave her. And she bought into that he was this action figure, you know, bigger than life. Pretty soon, Todd heads up to Portland 
to rekindle his connection with Lynn. At first, they were just kind of dreaming around that wouldn't it be nice if one of our spouses wasn't there anymore? Todd is an expert in erasing the lines between fantasies and reality. He tells Lynn that the secret organization he works with could take care of her husband, Dean, and his wife, Carol. He was starting to cross a line that, from fantasy, that maybe he could really do one of these things. Todd started cooking up a plan with Lynn to assassinate her husband, Dean Noyes. Lynn took out a $125,000 life insurance policy on Dean's life. We had had a conversation about life insurance. It's more, more just family planning, which was counter to the way the rest of the relationship was going. And now you just look back and kind of kick yourself for not having seen it. Killing Dean will be the opening act before Todd turns his sights on Carol. The thing is this, Todd isn't the kind of guy who likes to get his hands dirty. For his scheme to work, he needs a couple of saps as triggermen. And who could be better than his sidekicks, Norm Daniels and Dale Gordon? Todd really had to work on me hard as far as abuse. You know, like you kick a dog enough, you make him mean. And that's what Todd was doing to me. Now, this is important. Todd has always been a fantastic liar, but now he's taking things further. He's trying to use his tall tales to get two people murdered. He wants his powers of persuasion to turn fantasies into bloody reality. Spring 1998. In the backyard of his house in Cottonwood, Northern California, Todd Garten is grooming his pals Norman Daniels and Dale Gordon to become international hitmen. You know how they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions? They never mention where bad intentions take you. Todd's hatched a scheme to rid his lover Lynn of her husband and himself of his wife. Norman Dale will be his triggerman. They have no idea that the whole setup is a giant con. There, on the highway to hell, it's paved with the worst intentions possible, and Todd Garten is in the driver's seat. Now, as a sniper, this rifle becomes an extension of your body. It's not like Hollywood. From what I know of him, he'd be the greatest car salesman ever. He builds that thing. He can make you believe the story. But remember, Todd's not selling a used Chevy. He's convincing two ordinary people to kill on his command. So he plays on their weaknesses. He builds up shy Norman, and he beats down the more confident Dale. He just tried to break me down real bad. Todd was very abusive. He was mentally abusive, and, and uh, he wasn't physically abusive towards me, but it was just a mental nightmare. Todd started telling these guys that he was already an operative in an organization known as The Company. It was a secret organization of ex-CIA guys, Navy SEAL guys, soldiers of fortune, just really top-notch assassins. They would get a job to do, get paid for it, and then kind of, you know, go undercover. Working for The Company sounds great, but Todd needs to spin the tallest of tales if he's to convince these guys to kill his wife, Carol, and Lynn's husband, Dean. Here's how he does it. Step one, convincing Norman Dale that his friend Lynn, a mother of two, is in serious danger. Todd was telling me Dean Noyes was a wife beater, and he was just this mean, mean guy, mean, you know, a terrible person. Step two, it's an opportunity for Todd to introduce his ace sidekicks, Norman Dale, to the company. Todd was uh, supposedly a, a member of the company. He would have to go on these missions to go kill people. In fact, Todd told me several times that he'd get mail with pictures of people, the bodies that he'd killed. Step three, the law of a big payday. We were supposed to get paid a certain amount or a certain percentage of the insurance policy. Oh, and one last thing, the clock is ticking. 
What Todd would say to me is he said, well, we got yet another person that's trying to kill Dean because he's got so many enemies. And if we don't kill him, somebody else is going to kill him before we do. We're not going to get any money off it. Todd's performance is a winner. The boys are in. He just finally brainwashed me. And that's when I just let go and said, Todd, I'll just kill anybody you want. So where is Carol in all this? She's happy to be nesting and making plans for the baby. She's thinking about the future and pretty much ignoring Todd's friends. Well, Mrs. Todd Garten learned long ago to turn a blind eye to her husband's little projects. Besides, taking pot shots with your buds in the yard? It's not exactly head turning in this neck of the woods. What are rare in Carol's eyes are the times her husband acts like a grown-up. Like when he says he's heading back to Portland to check on a job. Thing is, the job Todd goes north to do is to hit on his lover Lynn's husband, Dean. The plan is to catch him in a parking garage and kill him on his way to work. For the most part, for Todd, it was the money angle. But for Lynn, it was something else. She wanted to be with Todd. That was the love of her life. Norman Dale are being hoodwinked, too. They think the company is real and that Dean Noyes deserves to die. I was supposed to do all the killing up there. It was entirely put on me. Todd had a vicious streak, but he wanted other people to do his dirty work. He wanted to watch you kill. There were no clues that these things are going on. I wasn't able to put all the pieces together. I, I didn't know that anything was off. At the last moment, Lynn gets cold feet. She'd rather divorce Dean than kill him. So she stops her husband from going to the garage where Todd, Norm, and Dale are waiting. It saves his life. I don't know how someone could be partaking in those activities and have such a solid facade on a day-to-day -day basis at home. It must have been an incredible thing that someone can live like that. Todd was absolutely furious. He was mad because he didn't get the money. He was mad because he didn't get to kill somebody. The failed hit on Dean is a big setback. And with Carol's due date getting closer and closer, Todd decides the hit on her just can't wait. This time, Norman Daniels gets to play the role of international killer. Figuring the fewer people in on it, the better, Todd doesn't tell Dale Gordon. Todd and Norman were spending more time together. But it was kind of a situation where I just didn't want to know. Now, if I would have known he was going to go after Carol, there is no way. But well, she was my best friend. I mean, he's just an evil son of a gun. I mean, he's just a terrible person. Todd prepares himself for the performance of a lifetime. Todd starts by showing Norm articles about company hits. He fills in details about Colonel Sean, the company's top secret commander. Then Todd drops his bombshell. His wife, Carol, is really a deadly IRA sniper, too. Don't let her looks fool you. She's lethal. Then Todd tells Norm the company considers him a hot prospect. Now, remember this. Norm Daniels is broke. He's never been a real critical thinker. And fear of destitution hasn't made him any smarter. Todd could pull some strings, and possibly Norman could get into the company, and he'd get him connected with Colonel Sean, and maybe arrange for him to do some work for them and have access to money, income that would help bail him out of a hole. Now, don't forget, this Colonel Sean and the whole story about Carol is made up. But Todd needs to sell it if 
He's going to get his wife and unborn son taken out. When Todd told these stories, he made them so exciting, so vivid, so kind of engrossing that Norm wanted to be part of that world. A few days later, Todd arrives with good news and an envelope sent from the company. Inside is the target of Norm's first solo mission. But there's one big catch, and it's a toughie. It's likely he's going to have to whack someone he knows. The company has to be sure he's got the guts for the hard jobs. Norman wanted to get in. He was going to have to do exactly what was said in a package he would be receiving. If he didn't, the company would kill Norman. If you open it, you're going to have to follow it no matter what. Norman said, OK. To Norm Daniel's shock, his buddy Todd is not even surprised, I mean, not even upset that his own wife is the target. So here's how Todd spins it. I was afraid this would happen, but I'm not surprised. It's because Carol has gone rogue. She tried to kill Colonel Sean. And anyway, she's not really my wife. It's not even my kid. And if Sean says she's got to go, well, you really don't have a choice. So Todd's played his biggest lie. He can only hope it's enough to get the job done. April 1998, Cottonwood, California. Norman Daniels is in shock. He can't believe his first solo assignment from the company is to kill his friend and mentor, Todd Garton's pregnant wife. Carol, that's not my wife. It's the target. What are we going to do? Norman liked Carol. He, he liked her quite a bit. He couldn't believe, you know, that she was going to be assassinated by him. Todd was telling him, you know, that's my wife, but man, if you don't do this, you're dead. Todd's played his big lie, Good. but it's not working. Choose you for no reason. Norm is sick about killing a friend. My superiors thought you could do it. You thought you could do it. So do it. Todd's in danger of losing his trigger man. Later that night, as instructed, Norm burns the envelope in pictures. But he does save the wax seal. He wants to have something that proves he was on a mission. If it, he ever got caught, I think he wanted to be able to say, I, you know, I did this in somebody else's direction. Todd presses on like everything's going according to his plan. He makes sure Norm buys himself a revolver, a 44. Now, revolvers are best because they don't leave casings at the crime scene. But Todd knows his plan is in trouble. His grip on his trained assassin is slipping. Todd tries a new angle. Hey, he calls you. Lynn and asks her to pretend that she's working for Colonel Sean. <sighs> Every waking minute. He gives her the code name Josephine. Todd pushes Norm to pick a code name, too. He'll need it for his interactions with the company. Very interesting, the code name he picked initially. It was called Hamlet. And he was going back and forth on whether he really wanted to do this or not. It, it troubled him greatly, because he liked Carol, and he didn't want to kill her. But he didn't want to be taken out himself. Todd had Lynn contact him and keep him on track. She was supposed to be the person that made sure that he was actually going to go through with it. Lynn's no con artist, but she does have a talent. And Lonely Norman is open to her kind of persuasion. Her messages to him began to be more sexual, and from him to her, they were engaging in cyber sex. Incredibly, he's falling for Lynn Noyes, who is Todd's mistress in all of this. Cybersex with Josephine is great. But Norman still wants out of the Carol hit. It's just not in him to kill a friend. I mean, especially one who's eight months pregnant. 
So unless he can make Norm afraid, it'll be another Portland, another disaster. Todd started putting together things on the computer. Orders were being sent to Norman, supposedly from Colonel Sean, who was high up in the company. Actually, these were coming from Todd, who was making them all up. The messages are blunt. Sean wants Carol dead. There is no wiggle room. Carol dies, or you do. And for good measure, we'll kill your boy. I think legitimately in his heart, he felt, I'm now into something. Colonel Sean wants me to do this. If I don't do it, something can happen to me or my son. Norman breaks. What parent won? He tells Colonel Sean he'll go through with it. He thinks he might die trying, but at least his son will be safe. He'd always done the best he could by his boy, and this was the tipping point. May 16, 1998, the day set for the hit. Todd's got a table at a gun show. It'll be his alibi and his chance to put Norm and Carol together in front of witnesses. Todd was selling uh, camouflage gear. That morning, Carol tours the local maternity ward. She knows she's carrying a boy. He's even got a name, Jesse James Garton. And she's in the thick of getting ready for his arrival. Todd's greatest fear was having that baby, because then he'd have to take care of it. And Todd couldn't handle taking care of anybody. Babies need love. And Todd was not love, he was just hate. After her appointment, Carol comes to the gun show. Todd's arranged to trade cars with her. Norm's there, too. Todd asks Carol to give their friend a lift. He sends her off to her doom and turns back to selling his wares, ready for his next role, single widower. When Carol and Norman get to the Garton place, Norm's clearly anxious. He had his pistol with him, a 44, a very, you know, high-powered pistol. He knows what his mission is, and he knows it has to be now. So Norm came to the moment. He had the gun. He and Carol were alone. Look, it doesn't take much force to pull the trigger, but he doesn't do it. It takes more than an hour before the pressure breaks him down. He still has to choose his son or Carol. Todd Garton has tricked his friend Norman Daniels into agreeing to kill his pregnant wife, Carol. He wanted to do it right then, but once again, his nerves got to him. Norman leaves the house, but the pressure forces him back. Norm and Carol sit and talk as friends. But slowly, the desperate need to protect his son breaks Norm. Kind of in a surreal situation, he pulled the pistol from his waistband. Carol doing? looked at him and couldn't believe it because this was her friend. <laughs> he shot her once, twice, five times in all. He killed Carol and her unborn baby. Some people think you can't make someone do something that's against their nature, but you can. Happens every day. Norm Daniels doesn't care what happens to him now. He did what he needed to do to protect his kid. He's done thinking. 6.45 p.m. at the Garton Place. It's time for a show. Todd loves to act. 
And he's arranged for an audience. Somebody call 911! Good buddy Dale Gordon, who knows nothing about the plot, is there to witness Todd's fake shock. He knew exactly where to go and walked right into the bedroom, found Carol lying there in her own blood. This is something that's burned in my mind forever. Todd was yelling instructions to me to talk to a 911 operator. And he's all saying, I need oxygen, I need all this stuff. Okay, we have a, uh, a, a pregnant woman. Uh -huh. She's on the floor, bleeding. Maybe somebody shot somebody here. I don't know what's going on. Paramedics try to revive Carol. But it's too late. She's dead. So's the baby. He also took a bullet. Carol was, a, was a, one of the nicest people you'd ever meet. It's just a shame, just sickening. And the, you know, the, what she had to suffer and go through in her last minutes is just calls your stomach. I think what Todd really thought was just that the Cottonwood police would come out and there was gonna be no investigation, nothing, and he'd get away with this, this bloody murderer and then nothing was gonna happen to him. But the cops do investigate. They begin by tracing Carol's movements before the murder. We brought Dale and Todd in an interview and Norman became a person of interest because the last person we know that was with Carol Garden was Norman Daniels. The cops discovered the abandoned Jeep, but no Norm. He had just disappeared. Nobody could get a hold of him. Nobody knew where he was. He had a house on Gas Point Road. Nobody was there. But Norm eventually comes home. And when the cops find Daniels, they find the gun, too. He tells us that you know, the gun's in the house, and it was under a pillow on his bed, 44 caliber, I think it was a Rossi. And I was actually there, and myself and Captain Foster, we pulled the pillow back and went, oh, my god. The cops start asking questions, but Norm Daniels doesn't say a word. Norman, I think, in the beginning, was afraid of this, the company that Todd had portrayed. Honestly, I believe the guy was afraid that if he talked, they could get to him, even if he was in jail or prison. While the cops are grilling Norm, Todd is orchestrating Carol's funeral. It was all about Todd. And one of the most incredible things he did was have Lynn come down to the memorial service. Everyone that knew Lynn and, and Carol knew they were not friends by any means. And they were saying to themselves, what is she doing here? After the funeral, Todd even brings Lynn to the hotel where Carol's family and friends are staying. They were pretty happy when they came back to the hotel, changing their bathing suits. They were really happy when they came down to the pool. And pretty much Lynn is attached to Todd like a leech. This is a very shocking thing. You know, this is the husband of the person who's just murdered. You know, just have some respect for the friends and family. While all this is going on, the, the detectives are kind of still talking to Norman and trying to get to the bottom of all of this. It takes a little while, but eventually, Daniel's caves. And the whole crazy story comes rolling out. In the beginning, I would say I, I thought the guy was crazy. Then as things checked out, you know, he told about this hit, and it sounded like it went down. Remember his premonition? That feeling he should hang on to part of the package that Todd gave him? Well, that wax seal is the link police need to tie Todd Gaunton to the plot to kill his wife and unborn son. 
Turned out it was the diving bubble pen that was in Todd's house that he would put the red wax on and did that. And we did a search warrant at the house. We found that pen with red wax on it. A month after Carol's death, Lynn and Todd are both charged with conspiring to kill her. A week later, Dale Gordon is charged with the attempted murder of Lynn's husband, Dean. We learned later what Todd Garden was, you know. He wanted, in his early days, to be a rock and roll singer, and he struck out. You know, he wanted to be a big military hero, and he didn't. And this guy had an identity problem, wanted to be something he wasn't. It's clear it did. It's clear you're behind it. A, a big explosion. There's only one explanation for the explosion. At his trial, Todd plays the victim. Illicit love as Lynn and Norman set him up. He was just in the way. Todd goes to work spinning one last big lie. Even though he was on trial for his life, Todd was the star of this thing. At some level, he seemed to enjoy it. Todd read this kind of outrageous statement about everybody else except him had been involved in this, and he was innocent. This time, no one buys the lies. The jury convicts Todd Garton, and they sentence him to death. There's no such thing as closure. I don't know what idiots come up with that, but a loss is a loss. You're still gonna miss her your whole life. She's still gone. There's no closure just because the guy's sitting in jail. We were very angry with Todd and the young kid actually shot her. We saw that he was just duped by Todd and he just used him as a pawn. I just didn't care. And, you know, it'll never be the same. We'll always miss her. Carol Garton's death and that of the child she carried was a masterpiece of manipulation. Her husband Todd convinced the guy he had to kill Carol to protect his own child. Ironic when you remember the real target of Todd Garton's plot was his own unborn son. Todd, Lynn, Norm Dale, they all went to prison. Todd's on death row. Todd Garton spent a lifetime creating stories, but the story of his life is nothing to be admired.